Good afternoon again. <laughs> I would like to introduce Professor John Gerkin, that is professor at the Department of Physics at Durham University, United Kingdom, and he is director of Biophysical Science Institute. His research field is in, on optics and optical optoelectronics, optical microscope, nonlinear imaging, adaptive optics, optical instrumentation for life science and medicine. And uh, he also traveled across the ocean to come here to Brazil. Thank you, Professor, for your presence. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's good evening. It's about quarter to nine at night. Um, I'd also, again, like to thank uh, for the invitation for coming here and also for laying on some very nice British weather when we go out and have coffee. Um, the other thing is, following the previous talk, there is a way round having all this problem with sunlight hitting your skin. It's called coming to England. Um, so what I'm going to talk, there's two other things I want to say. Again, as, as other people have said, please feel free to ask questions. And the other thing is that, and I think I'm speaking here on behalf of all the speakers, um, we're all here, or most of us are here for all the time that this is running. Please come up and speak to us outside. You may feel too embarrassed to ask what you think is a stupid question in public, but please feel free to come up to speak to us and ask those questions. Trust me, there is no such thing as a stupid question. I do a great deal of multidisciplinary science and trying to um, get over ideas and to understand what, for example, a biologist may say to me is critically important. So please do feel free to come up and ask us. The other thing is, and I should, I suppose, to the audience here, never open up by saying something you're not going to do, but I'm not going to talk about cancer at all. What I'm looking at doing, I don't think there are any images of anything like that. Fundamentally, what I'm going to look at is the tools that you may want to use, partly for diagnosing cancer, but very often that are going to be used in life science experiments. In other words, work to understand what's going on down at the biological level. But these also do have applicability to when you start using diagnostic methods and things in, in, a cancer, in a cancer manner. Because in the end, actually trying to understand what's happening at the cellular level and then up and down from that is critically important. Um, so we've started off in the beginning. If I'm not careful, I will start singing that as well. Um, I thought I ought to just say as well, so this is Durham University. It's the, in England, it's the third oldest university in England. Um, and this is Durham Cathedral, and this is the castle, um, and it's a Norman castle, and students do actually live in the castle. The ones that don't work hard enough get kept there. Um, so this is, it's a World Heritage Site, and in fact, just to show you where it is, this is a map of Britain, so we heard from Dundee is sort of vaguely up here earlier, and then uh, Durham is down here, uh, so London would be down here, and in fact, uh, this is what it looks like from the air. So the university or the science block of the university is about here. Um, this is the cathedral. That was the castle. And most of you have actually seen pictures of inside the cathedral and inside the college that's attached to the castle. If you've seen Harry Potter, you've seen bits of the, of the thing. So it's a very old city. It's a very nice place to come and see us centered around the river. What am I actually going to talk about now? Well, uh, I'm going to give you some background, and I'm going to talk about some optical imaging in general. And the rest of the afternoon, we'll then look at different methods of doing optical sectioning in the end to build up three-dimensional images. And again, this obviously has applicability in cancer studies as well. Um, but the actual examples I'm going to use don't come from that. But that's, that's, that's just a, a, a by the by. I think... One of the things is that's critically important that all biology and all clinical medicine really starts with your eyes, and it starts with observation. So a, a doctor's main tool is his eyes. You know, doctors, if you go into your doctor carrying your leg, hopping, even a, the doctors in Britain would go, oh, he's probably got something wrong with his leg. 
In other words, he's used his eyes to, to understand what's going on. And clearly, as we go down in more detail, we want to try and understand what's happening at a smaller and smaller level. That means we want to use lenses or microscopes. And the other thing is that this desire for driving better physics, better biology, better understanding of imaging, actually drives physics forward as well. So Abbe, who developed, wanted to develop a better microscope for Zeiss, actually was spending a lot of time advancing optical physics. The other thing that I think is true very much in relation to biology and clinical medicine, probably that's different from 10 or 15 years ago, is you very much now want to quantify something. You want to put a number on it. It's not so much just looking at a picture and going, yes, it's got better, it's changed. You'd like to say, yes, it was six here, it's now four, it's getting better. So very often, imaging and down at the cellular level becomes important towards this quantification. Um, so in other words, now this is actually what I'd like people to do. I'd like everyone to do all their genetic manipulations on elephants um, because then we can actually put, the mi you know, um, put microscopes inside animals. So this is, this is, you see, physics comes first and we, we discovered the, uh, the cell. But it's actually true. So this was, what, 400 years ago. This is a little thing um, that was made by Leeuwenhoek. And in fact, what it has here is a little glass ball. And that gave you a magnification of about 200 times. Um, and he took some images and things here. Then there were m m microscopes made which had compound. They had more than one lens. The experiment, I don't, uh, this thing here is what does the focusing. It drives the sample backwards and forwards. And this is how he moved the sample up and down into his field of view. And Leeuwenhoek took and drew pictures of sperm, live sperm, on the end of the needle. How he got them there, I do not know. Sorry, I don't want to know. Um, but just to say, this is very simple, and in a moment you'll see some images taken from that, and they were remarkably good. And then Robert Hooke in, in Britain, again, what, 1630, something like that, he used a microscope that was on Janssen's design, and he discovered the cell, looking at pieces of cork. So physicists did actually have played a role. But what do we actually want these methods to do? So from an optical method, very often, particularly down at the level I'm talking about here, you want subcellular resolution images. We'd like to do them in vivo. We want to minimize the damage to the sample. So all these are very important things. It's clearly, if you're going to ever put something in a clinic, you know, preferably your diagnostic technique, you don't want it to kill or damage your patients. You want to watch dynamic changes. You want to quantify them. And I think the other bits, there are three things that have happened a lot in the last 10, 15 years, perhaps a little bit longer. But the biologist's ability to do genetic manipulation, as we'll see later on, not in this talk, but in the next one, becomes very important with particularly this thing called green fluorescent protein. And the other thing we should always remember now is we can go and buy a very, very powerful computer for only a few hundred dollars. You know, what the computing power that's in this, or that's even in your phone, is very, very good at analyzing images. So therefore, generating data and then quantifying it now becomes very much easier than it was 10 years ago, definitely, even five years ago. The other one, because it's going to come up in several talks, and I, uh, people are probably aware of it, this is used a great deal now in biology, this green fluorescent protein. So you link it to a reporter gene, so you splice it into the DNA. And when one particular gene is producing a protein, at the same time, n the little bit next door to it then produces this green fluorescent protein. So you can then say, well, this gene is working, it's expressing, it's giving out its protein. We also get this fluorescent marker that comes out that only happens in one particular area. It comes from a jellyfish, and you can then do some manipulations of it. So this is Roger Chen, who, who won the Nobel Prize, um, what, about four years ago now, for his work with two others on developing this green fluorescent protein. He's now produced a whole range of green. They used to call that red green fluorescent protein. Luckily, it's now got different names, and they use coral as well. So I think the red one there is actually a thing called M. cherry or tomato but they've basically produced a whole suite of colors. And it's worthwhile knowing these tools are here 
So although you may be interested later in studying cancer from a clinical perspective, these are some very important biological tools that you can use to help you. So I've sort of said this before, what the life scientist wants is subcellular, three-dimensional, in-depth and in vivo. And hopefully by the end of the second talk that I'm going to give, you'll see how far we've got to doing some of this. It's also worth, in my view, and I don't know what was said this morning in relation to clinical instruments, a clinician desires something slightly different. They, their main driver, quite correctly, is to improve treatment to the patient. They want it to be easier and more reliable for the diagnosis, make the treatment more effective and to monitor it. That may not be the same as a scientist who really wants to understand what's going on. And it's worthwhile being aware of the difference between the two. And then whoever's funding the clinician wants it to be more cost effective. And joking aside, they'd also love to be able to announce, we have a cure for cancer. So it's worthwhile just when you're working across disciplines, which many of you are, what the drivers are that make interactions work. So what's the aim? of my talk. I want to get put some of the principles behind optical microscopy, when optical methods work, when they don't work, when they break down, to give you some practical suggestions. And this comment at the bottom, if you go away after I've spoken and all I've done is make you think, I've been successful. That's what I want you to do. I once had an undergraduate lecture about three years ago and he said, I hate this lecturer, he makes me think. That was the sole purpose of what I was really trying to do. And in essence, that's what I'm trying to do here. And the other thing is with all the tools you'll hear about, and this is true not just for microscopy, it's everywhere. You need to choose the right tool for the right job. You can cut your toenails with a hedge trimmer, but it's not the right tool to use. It's a sledgehammer to crack a walnut or whatever analogy you want to use. So do think about it. If you can do it, let's take the PDT. Don't buy a £20,000 laser system if you can do it with three LEDs and a bit of plastic. That works. If you can image something with a webcam, do it. So think carefully. What does a microscope actually, whoops, what does a microscope actually do? Well, it clearly, and many optical instruments, they magnify the image. We want resolution of the features. So what the resolution does is it separates detailed features out. And crucially, as you'll see, I think in one slide a bit later, we need contrast. We want to be able to see black from white. And contrast is the most important thing. Why do people develop um, the fluorescence techniques? It's to increase the contrast between healthy or diseased tissue. So contrast is a really strong driver. So the other thing is, if you're doing imaging, if you start with rubbish, even if you do wonderful image processing, basically you're still going to get rubbish. You can't trust it. So the better you start off with your initial data, the better it is. So how do we do magnification? Well, actually, people like myself that are short-sighted, um, we actually are better at magnifying because the near point of my eye, though actually it's getting further away with age, but near point makes it the image appears bigger because I've got it closer to my eye and I can keep it in focus. So then you use a lens to bring the near point in. So this is where it may look like normally. If I put a lens in, although my object is here, it appears to the eye as though it's here and very much bigger. So the lens basically shifts the near point and spreads the light. It increases the image size on the retina. In a, in a, in a microscope, here is a sample. We may have several lenses, but in essence, what it's doing, here's the sample, and the lens is making it appear as though it's coming from a little bit further away, but it's much bigger, so it covers more of the retina. That's all a microscope does. And whether it covers the retina or a camera, that's all it's trying to do. I said earlier that try and remember about that very simple microscope with a simple ball lens. So this is um, from Leica, as it happens. This is the image, I, I apologize, I can't remember what the sample is, it's, it's really not important. This is the image from that 400-year-old microscope with a single lens. This is what you get from a modern Leica or Leica microscope. Actually, that wasn't bad. If the sample had been more complicated, you see more problems, as I'll show you in a moment. But actually, that's pretty good. 
this is an electron micros uh, microscope set at the same magnification, and this is a, a dark background. But you can see that actually what we're trying to do in here, this apparently gives you more detail, and it's mainly in here, if we compare that bit up there, because it's got more contrast. You can see the detail more clearly. So that, again, is the important bit. There are limitations on a simple lens, though. In fact, if you start increasing the magnification much above two or three times with a simple single lens, you start to get distorted images. And the other problems with the early microscope is they had no way of recording the images. Now, that's something we've got. Everyone, well, I was going to say everyone in this room, I don't, but the majority of people in this room probably have a mobile phone with a camera in it. That camera is actually phenomenally good. It's a different talk, but I use my iPad, and I do actually use it as a method of cancer detection for fluorescence. And you can do it with a camera that's in an iPad and the, and the, and, and the fluorophores we've, we've heard about. And I, you do it, you plug it into the monitor, and everyone can see it on the screen. It's very easy to do. What are the optical limitations? These are terms that people will talk about, and I thought it was just worthwhile putting in a little bit of physics. So there's a thing called chromatic aberration. So most of the time you're using white light. White light has different wavelengths. So when it goes through some optics, it gets bent or refracted by different amount. So what happens if we took so, some light that was coming in here? In this case, the blue light would be focused here. The red light would be focused here. So they're not going to be, the images aren't going to be correlated. You probably know if you've looked through a cheap plastic microscope, you see colors around the edge. That's chromatic aberration. There are ways of coming around these things, but I think it's worthwhile just bringing them up. Spherical aberration is slightly different. That's because you use light across the whole of a lens, and the light at the end, at the edge, again gets bent more than the light in the middle, so the light at the edge comes to a focus here, the other light comes to a focus further on. These are points, actually, that I will go back on um, whenever it is, tomorrow afternoon, um, because it has some relevance to how you correct and improve images when you want to look really deeply. Um, what it looks like if you plotted, so this is an intensity profile or three-dimensional. This is, if it was a perfect image, you'd get a single spot. This is what you get from diffraction. With aberration, you can see we've got this sort of blurry bit around the outside. We've mucked it up. And also, what you can start to get is a sort of curved image that if you then, th instead of being a lovely flat field, it gets distorted and bent in other directions. It's the other major one. It's, it's astigmatism, so straight lines appear bent, uh, for example, and it's no you can't get the whole of your image in focus at the same time. The other one that I come back to is resolution. So what is the minimum resolution? We think of it, what's the smallest? We could see two dots. So if I had two infinitely small dots, how, what's the closest I can put them together and actually see them as two dots? There are lots of theories behind this. Um, aberrations, the things I've just talked about, limited. But even if you've got perfect optics, as we'll hear in the last talk, you still have something called diffraction. So if you focus it down, the light never focuses to an infinitely small point. And that limits the resolution. But what's the ultimate limit to that? If you've got a microscope, the crucial number for the resolution is not its magnification, it's its numerical aperture. There's th that's a slightly simplistic comment, but that's the really important thing. The magnification does have a role because it says how big it, how large it spreads it over the camera or over the detector. But the ultimate limit is the numerical aperture. So what does it mean? That I can resolve. I've got one nice small spot. And this is the diffraction pattern that you get from a focused beam of light. If I get two, yep, I can still resolve those two. That one, I can't really resolve. I can't see two peaks. I can't separate them out. And clearly, if you do this with lots of them, you've got that one is just about at the resolution limit. That one's not resolved. You can put all these bits together. So it's how resolution is how easily you can separate them. There's one, I think this is where it comes up. There are lots of ways of quantifying this, but this is the sort of one thing, and I apologize, there are three equations on it. The important bit, don't worry about them. The important bit is the minimum resolution depends on the wavelength, so the shorter the wavelength, the better the resolution I can get. 
The other thing is, it depends on the numerical aperture, this light gathering power of the lens. So, and it, but it depends on one over that. So the bigger I make that, the smaller I make the points at which I can do the resolution. So as my physics teacher used to say, this is an important thing, put it on a board, put it above your bed, hammer it in so that when you wake up in the morning, you see this hanging above your bed, right? Um, that was my A-level physics teacher, and I still remember that. So remember as well that higher magnification does not automatically equal better resolution. It's the numerical aperture you need to worry about. The magnification spreads the light over a target, which is important, but it's not the governing factor. I also said contrast is seeing black from white. And you can have infinite, infinite resolution, but if you can't see black from white, it's a complete waste of time. So this is an image, and I, you're going to have to trust me, I'm not going to do anything else to this image in a moment except draw a white line around it. I'm not changing the resolution of the screen or anything. So it's just a gray series of gray scales going down here. And clearly at this point here, you can't resolve. Um, so it would be black right at this tip here. So around about here, they're gray but your eye cannot see the difference between that level of gray and the back. If I put a white line around it, that white line is just a single line going through it. You can now see clearly what's inside and what's outside. I have not changed the resolution. I've changed the contrast. Another take-home message. All the imaging techniques that are used for cancer diagnosis, it's contrast you're trying to, to maximize in general. Image brightness clearly comes into it, and I'm not going to go in. I, people, I can make these slides available to people. I, I don't mind that. Um, but it depends on your illumination. It depends on the magnification of your objective. Um, the other bit, the take-home bet is clearly you need some light or you can't see anything. But whenever you're imaging anything, you want to use as little light as possible, exactly as we heard from the previous talk. Otherwise, we're beginning to perturb the sample, even if it's a few lumps of menelin stuck in a, in, a, in a cell, we're starting to perturb the system. So try and keep any light level as low as possible. So hopefully here, I've quickly gone through what the properties of the light are. Microscopes are based on simple things, numerical aperture and contrast. They're the things I just wanted to make sure that people remembered, were aware of, because if you're starting to do anything in terms of imaging somewhere along the line, these things are important to remember. A modern microscope looks horribly complicated. Actually, it's not much better than the, the cheap and simple ones. You basically have a light source, a lens here, and some eyepieces. It's just they've put more bits of glass in them. Um, what it's doing, here's the light source, here's the sample. You have an objective lens, a second lens. It produces an image, and the eyepiece lets you see this image. So it looks as though, to the eye, it's coming down here, so it looks as though it's magnified. The thing I thought it might be worthwhile, people may not realize this, this is a simple 10 times lens, and I think this one here has actually 10 lenses inside it. If you take, a, and that's why you can pay, um, so if you take some oil, some more expensive lenses, higher numerical aperture, they may have 20 elements inside, and that's why they cost $10,000, and they're not mass produced. Um, so they're pretty complicated, and these are all done to correct for the aberrations I, I mentioned. Um, this is what it looks like. This is a long working distance. You can begin to see. I just use this in here. The other bit I do notice, it's worthwhile pointing out here, on the objective, it will tell you what the magnification is, what the numerical aperture is, and then down here, it will normally now say infinity, which means it's designed to be worked with what are called infinity optics, parallel light. It doesn't matter about that for the moment. And then this bit here may have... Zero means it's designed to work without a cover slip. It may have water or it may have something else that's in there. It's what you look at. Again, if you're doing any imaging, you want the highest numerical aperture for the best resolution. You want to use the correct... If it says it's a lens for use with oil, don't use it in water. It's designed to work in oil. I'll come back to that actually tomorrow. It's a, there's actually... I say that jokingly, there's a very important point there. Is it with or without a cover slip? And then worry about the magnification. 
So we've heard a lot about fluorescence imaging. It's the most standard method that's used, I think, pretty well in biology, except for just using your eyes directly. Um, because you can specifically label things, as we've been hearing earlier this afternoon, specific cancer cells or the like. Um, the illumination in a microscope normally goes through the optics. It's called epi-illumination, and it re does require high contrast. And this is, and again, you'll see why tomorrow I put this up. We put, let's say, ultraviolet light in, it goes up, loses a bit of energy and comes back down. We get blue light. And if I was focusing the light in here, my, s my focus is in here. So this is all the, the excitation light. I'm, it's shown in, blue in red in here. It's being focused in and comes out the other side. So we've got a, a big column of light, if in essence, being illuminated. The way we do this, again, fairly obviously, down here, so the light from your light source comes in through here. We filter out the wavelengths we want. Let's say blue light. It hits a beam splitter that reflects the blue light through an objective. The fluorescence is generated. The fluorescence is green, let's say, goes through there. This filter blocks off any of the excitation light, and it goes through to your detector. Again, you don't have to light sources. They're available from lots of different methods. As we've seen, you can use LEDs or lasers. Clearly, this is why chromatic aberration I mentioned earlier can be important. The other thing that it's worthwhile bearing in mind, and again, this will be used, and I'm sure it'll be used in other things, when you excite a fluorophore up, as we saw in the last uh, talk, there's a level of time before the light comes back out again. Typically, it's nanoseconds. Um, some fluorophores have very long fluorescence lifetime, typically nanoseconds. So if you plotted, so this is time going along here, this is intensity coming out, so I excite up a large number of molecules, and most of them emit in a very, very short time, in this case, what, about three nanoseconds, something like that, and then it exponentially goes on and on. So this is called the fluorescence lifetime. It's the length of time it takes for the light to come back out again. And it's worthwhile remembering that it is potentially an important the fluorescence lifetime is very, very sensitive to the surroundings. The viscosity, the temperature, the pH, the local chemistry. So it can be a very powerful tool. Optical sectioning. So I said in the end, what we really want to try and do is build up pretty three-dimensional pictures. So the normal way of doing this is with confocal microscopy. Basically what it's doing is enabling you to get good contrast between individual sections. And the simple way it works, and I think, although many of you will be aware of this, you, oh, a confocal microscope, yeah, I've used one of those for looking at biological samples. This is the way that it generally works. So we have some light, works? Yes. Some light comes in, gets focused down onto my subject. The light gets, comes back. It could be fluorescence, it could be reflection, it doesn't matter. Gets then reflected off this beam splitter, focused down, and it's sent through a small pinhole onto a detector. And if we then have light that's come in from a different level, so let's say we've got something that's deeper in our sample, the light that comes back through there won't be in focus from the objective lens so that when it flows through the system here, most of it will re get rejected by the pinhole. So the pinhole throws away your out-of-focus light. So that gives us, in one point, what we then need to do is scan that point, typically in X and Y, and then we can build up an image. So we've scanned our point, taken an image, and then we advance the optics, or we move the sample. We normally move the optics in Z direction, and we can then build up a series of individual images that we can then stick in a computer, and this is again a crucial bit, and stick them back together to get this three-dimensional object that we can then look at in space. And this is the way that most, a lot, a great deal of imaging is done. And again, I'm, I'm sure that in relation to the clinical instruments, parts of this come through as well. You can use detectors. You'll have had all these photomultipliers, avalanche, photodyes. They all actually work very well. The other thing it's worthwhile saying in this um, that people often forget, and this will again be particularly applicable tomorrow, you can do excitation using infrared light if you get the right fluorophores and the right situation. Infrared light does not get scattered as much by tissue. It's a longer wavelength. Generally, it's not absorbed as much either. That means you do get light going through your sample as well, as long as it's not too thick. And 
this is an important bit that you can actually get, you're scanning your beam in transmission as well, so you can build up a transmission image. And that shouldn't be forgotten. A lot of times, so you've got light going through it, it's passing through your sample, it's being affected by the sample, so it's got information on the structure of your sample. So it's, it's worthwhile remembering that. Sorry, second equation, did warn you. Um, this is the advantages of having a point scan system is it gives you very good axial resolution. Again, ignore the number. Uh, it depends again on the wavelength, so the shorter the wavelength, the better my axial resolution. The crucial bit here is it now depends on one over the numerical aperture squared. So if I use a higher numerical aperture lens, let's say, to make the sum simple, because it's now getting very late for me, if I started off with one that had a numerical aperture of 0.2, well, let's say 0.25, I can square 0.25, 0.25, if I then go to a, if I, if that, if I then increased the um, numerical aperture, that would give me a certain thing. If I doubled it, I'm going to get 0.25, we go to 0.5, square that, I'm going to get um, 25 times. I'm going to get a very much better just by doubling. So I've doubled the numerical aperture. I've actually improved my imaging in that case by a huge amount. It's worthwhile remembering that. Um, you can do this. You can actually measure that fluorescence lifetime by scanning each point and waiting with a short pulse of light and watch and plot out what the fluorescence lifetime decay is to do fluorescence lifetime imaging. Um, so you can actually use this method here. There are lots of commercial systems available. There are some limitations, though, and again, with any wonderful tool, you want to think what the limitations are. You, it's difficult to go much faster than 25 frames a second. I mean, there are ways around it, but it, it's, it's a good rule of thumb. It's very wasteful of light, and generally, we're exciting fluorophores with blue and ultraviolet light, which can be phototoxic. It's, it's not a good light to be putting into things, generally speaking. And there are limitations on the sample thickness because both my light going in and my light coming out is being scattered, bounces around inside the tissue. That means if it, it may have come from my focal plane, but if it bounces around, it's going to miss my detector because it's not going to go through the pinhole. So there is a problem. And you therefore get a loss of contrast as you go down with depth. You can speed it up. So instead of having a single point scan, single pinhole, you can actually have an array of pinholes um, which you scan round. You, you normally have an array of lens, mini lenses as well. So basically, you scan the pinholes round very, very rapidly. Um, and so you illuminate a large area. The, beam, the, 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 pin, the pinholes are arranged in such a manner that basically it sort of puts a series of beamlets that scans an area of the disk. The light comes back, and instead of going to a single detector, it goes to an array, in other words, a camera. And in this way, you can use this spinning disk, and it does work quite well. This is actually the way that in Britain, um, John Logie Baird invented the television. So the original television that was invented in Britain the Americans developed a slightly different, and I apologize, I've forgotten his name now, but this person lived in the village that I lived in in Scotland, but he invented the television that ran by scanning lenses round at high speed. He had some interesting things. His lenses were large, and they used to fly around the room and knock holes in plaster. It's probably not practical for a television. The rotating disc, it gives you some optical sectioning, but it's not as good. It's worthwhile bearing that in mind. And it becomes difficult when section, well, the sections you're looking at are generally a few microns thick. Um, but you can then do things at, at quite high speeds. So it's very good if you've got a sample. Now, clearly, you may want to image very rapidly because if your sample is alive and breathing, it's going to be moving. So you may want to take your optical image very, very rapidly to try and minimize the level of movement. This is clearly going to be possible true if you're, if you're dealing with patients. Again, you know, killing the patient just to take some images so they stop breathing is viewed generally as not good clinical practice. I'll say tomorrow of a way, another way you can get around this problem of when you're imaging live samples. Um, there's an optical method that we've developed that works 
um, wouldn't work quite so well with this one, but it is a thing you need to think about. There's another technique as well, and this is, this is actually worthwhile really being aware of. Um, it's proposed originally and built by, by Mark Neal and, and um, Tony Wilson in Oxford. And all they do is they take a light source and a lens, and they then have a grid. And they literally just have a grid of lines. It's black and white lines. And you take an image. And the th so you, you project onto this a pattern of light. The pattern of light comes back through here and gets picked up on the camera. And what actually happens, so here is, this isn't a physicist cell because it's not square, right? So this is, this is a biologist cell. Um, and we project onto it a pattern of lines. And we take an image. We take an image. That's it. So there's my first image. It's got, black, it's got lines on it. It didn't get, have any light there. And we then move the grid one-third of its spacing. And we take another picture. And then we do it again, and we take a third picture. So you can see that different parts have been blacked out. Now, I'm not going to go into the maths of what happens here, but it happens that if you take image one and take away image two and square it, and you take image two and take away image three and square it, what happens in the focal plane, everything adds up to give you even illumination. Outside the focal plane, it adds up to give you nothing. There's a reason behind that, and I'm not, not, this is now is not the time to go into it. If someone wants me to go into it, I'll do it afterwards. So you take that one, and that one, and that one, and then when you put them together, you end up with this thing. It's actually a very, very efficient way of doing it. And, and uh, Mark Neal actually published a paper doing confocal microscopy with a candle. It's very, very light efficient. It's not, again, as you go deeper into your sample, it causes problems because the pattern breaks up because it's going through the sample. But this does work. And we've, I've actually used this method on imaging a clinical sample. It was teeth. It wasn't um, cancer. But it does work as a method of going through and um, Mark Neal, again, has used this actually for imaging um, throat cancer to do three-dimensional imaging where he did it through an endoscope because clearly you can project this pattern down a, down a, a coherent endoscope. And he did it, um, he got the person to drink um, basically uh, photoferrin 9, which got taken up. It's interesting your comment, how does it get taken up? Well, they just got them to drink it and enough got taken up that they could actually image inside. I'd like, with the last three or four slides, to actually do one other question. And I think this is a very relevant one, and it's interesting. You may have said something along similar lines this morning. I missed the talk, or it may have come up. When you're doing this, do you actually need a whole picture? And very often, the answer to that is no, you don't. In other words, you may just want, for example, a depth profile. Now, um, so the advanced like the the sample I'm going to use here, and I realized I could have modified this, and I'll say why at, at the end, um, is this is actually, again, it happens to be imaging a tooth. But the same would be true, and it does work if you do this looking at tissue. It just so happens the example I've done was in teeth. So you take, in this case, a laser diode. You focus the light into, a long, into an optical fiber. What's an optical fiber? It's a long, thin pinhole. Oh, a confocal system. So we send the light in, we collimate the light, we focus it down on the sample, and we send the light back, and the light from the focus goes back down our single-mode optical fiber. It goes onto a detector, and we can detect it. And then all we need to do, we're not going to get an image, but if we scan the patient backwards and forwards, no, well let's move the lens backwards and forwards, we can take a depth profile through the tooth. We're not building up an image, but we're getting information beneath the depth. And then in the case of dental disease, this is actually a very, it's what you want to do. It's giving you the information. And we can actually, by changing the lens or changing the size of the fiber, change our depth resolution. If we use a small fiber, we get very high resolution, but it's harder to go deeper in. Um, we've actually made a variation of this that works in fluorescence for tracking drug within the eye. So we can actually put eye drops on that happen to be fluorescent, and we can watch the way they move into the aqueous to track in real time in human patients what's happening inside 
as this drug goes into the eye. Again, if anyone's interested, I can show you a video that we've got of how the drug moves around with inside the eye. Um, but I use this one because it's a simpler example. Um, so the advantage of this, it can be small, flexible, and all this sort of thing. So you can begin to think about doing it. Um, it's only got a limited field of view. Um, so we took um, 60 teeth, just to make it slightly clinical, and dentists call them dull, shiny, and brown lesions. I won't go into the things. Dull is bad, probably means it's going to carry on getting worse. Shiny means it's probably getting better. And brown means it may be stained, but it's probably healthy. Um, and uh, I should have said, for those of you of a nervous disposition, look away now if you don't like looking at teeth. But this is what the lesions look like. And we measured through, so we took a depth profile. This one's a good example to choose. You can see that the white lesion, when I turn the light off there, it's a slightly different color. It's because it has a different structure. Its structure's been broken, it, so therefore the light behaves in a different way to it. And we can take a depth profile through that point in the lesion, and we then compared it with what we saw historically. So this is what you get from a shiny lesion, and a shiny lesion is supposed to be good. So purple is sound, this is depth across here. So basically what this says is we're just getting one nice strong reflection from the front of a tooth. Um, and a shiny one is one that's healing itself. That's probably good. This is from a dull lesion, which is a bad lesion. So we get a reflection off the front, but you can see actually we're getting a reflection from deeper inside the tooth as well. Again, the purple is, is, is the healthy area. And this is because the tooth... The outer surface may be intact, but it's being eaten away underneath, dissolved away. And so we've got a, if you like, there's a hole developing between the outer surface and some point inside. The good news is, under the right conditions, this thing can actually heal itself. Fluorine and calcium can go in and, if you like, fill that hole that's developing. And that's exactly what happens in a brown lesion. So in a brown lesion, you see in this case there were two peaks, but the the tooth actually sort of healed itself. The reason it's probably brown is because some staining got in. You may have drunk a cup of tea and some of the tea went into the tooth as it was healing itself, for example. Um, but so therefore, using this method, we can just very simply, we're not taking an image, but we've just thought and taken a depth profile. Um, this is what happens if you have a tooth where the top is actually roughened up. In other words, it's cavitated. You get this horrible thing because the light's bouncing all over the place. I hope what I've done, it hasn't been specifically about cancer. It's been much more a generic thing about how optics and light gets, gets used. What I'm going to talk about tomorrow is actually taking this further, how you really start to use these methods in vivo. And uh, it's very much going to be pushing on to what's currently um, the sort of world-leading methods of doing some of these imaging. But a lot of this... I felt, and for this and some of the other talks, if the basics weren't in place um, that you weren't aware of, they'd get missed. So in the end, the ultimate resolution, these are the ones pin on your, on your hotel wall tonight. They won't mind if you're writing felt pen all over the, over the wall. Um, I'm not paying for this. Oh, you think they might mind? Okay, sorry. Um, right. Oh, no, that's all right. The cleaning ladies are all physicists. They'll know what it is. So this is, remember, wavelength, numerical aperture of the air, Higher magnification lens does not automatically mean better resolution. You need contrast. If you're doing any imaging, you need contrast. Be able to see black from white. You need to think what you want to look at. And these, this is true. But this is th I said I want to make you think. This is true of any experiment that you might want to do if you think about it. Decide what you want to see. What's the best method for what you want to do? And don't make it overly complicated. There's a phrase that's used a huge amount in English, and it's called KISS, which is keep it simple, stupid. In other words, the simpler you can make it, the better it is. It's a horrible marketing thing, and people use it all over the place. But actually, it's really true. And the other thing is, the ra reason for trying to keep it simple is it's difficult enough to deal with patients or animals or the thing that you're looking at. Therefore, really try and keep the optics as simple. And then again, record a method that you want to. Um, again, I can make this. If you're interested at all in anything on microscopy, there is a wonderful website that's funded 
by most of the microscope manufacturers. If you put microscopy primer into Google, it will go there. It's got some wonderful Java applets you can play for hours on end. It's far more interesting than I am. Um, and there's also a PDF, which is very useful to download. There are also many other books. So hopefully you've, in you've got something out of that, and we'll build on it, and I'm sure it will build on the things that people have done elsewhere. It's much less clinical. It's much less directly biological. What I'm talking about tomorrow will go much more in that direction. But hopefully it's put some planks in place for things that you will use, may have used, would like to use, and you know what's going on. Thanks very much. <coughs> Questions? Hello, thanks for the nice presentation. You were talking about uh, the conf call microscopy, structured Im image microscopy, but uh, why not the two photon microscopy? Wait till tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I, I'll tell you. So, what I'm specifically going to con I wanted to put this in place because if you haven't got those parts that are in there, so what I'm going to talk about tomorrow is very much focusing on, and I'm going to use it as non-linear microscopy, and you'll see why I'm using that phrase, how you can then do that in vivo, and then also looking at another technique called SPIM, which is we've been using for zebrafish, again, which is a potentially very interesting, and then actually going on and how you can correct for, for aberrations within tissue. So there you go. Come tomorrow because it answers the questions. So uh, you talked a little bit about uh, s um, spatial aberrations. Yeah. Uh, does that mean the image just is never in focus? Is that, is that what that yes, equates to? Yeah. I, um, if I'm speaking as a physicist, focus is one aberration. But in essence, yes, it's exactly. So in other words, it's never as clear, as never as sharply in focus as you'd like to look at. Again, I can show a picture tomorrow. It, what becomes a real problem when you start looking in three dimensions is you may get the top in focus, but as I start to go through my sample, I go through a mixture of water and lipids and fat and structure, and each of those acts like a little micro lens. And so one bit of the image goes in focus and another bit's out of focus at the same time, but they're next door to each other. So yes, that's exactly. Focus mathematically is thought of as a special aberration. But yes, what it would appear to the user is they're blurry, which is what people think of as being out of focus. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit specific question. Back at the beginning of your talk, you talk about GFP, and I worked with it a, a bit for a while. And I'd like to know if you have any information if GFP produces the kind of uh, oxygen uh, compounds when excited? Um, <laughs> it's, so I'm not, if you don't know the answer, admit your ignorance. Um, and I'm going to admit my ignorance that I don't know the answer to that question. Just if you but I know a man who, d well, I think I remember a man. So the person who's done a lot of studies that I'm aware of on GFP, and if you like its photochemical effects under one photon and two photon excitation, because you excite up different energy levels. So there's a reason why they're different. Um, is someone called Angus Bain, who it's B-A-N, B-A-I-N. I don't know the answer to your question, but yes, it, it's one other comment I would say. Remember, whenever you do any imaging or whenever you put light in the sample for a diagnostic purpose, so treatment, we want to put it in there, we are perturbing the system. You've altered it. You've put light into a sample that doesn't normally see light, so some nasty effects might start. Always remember that. And it's a comment. I, the reason I'm saying it is with GFP, people think, oh, it just produced naturally by the cell. No, I'm sorry. Um, the zebrafish you're going to see tomorrow whose heart is beating and emitting GFP, it doesn't normally have bits of a jellyfish inside its body. And the GFP is being produced, and it's used. Th so I think there's two answers to your question. One is the GFP is using up amino acids to make the GFP protein, so that may have an effect as well. So it might be mopping up some, might be taking some. And the other one is, yes, it breaks down. And when it breaks down, there are true, it produ if I remember correctly, it produces free radicals rather than singlet oxygen. But take that 
very, very warily. The other thing is GFP is a bloody great molecule. It's a big protein. And the cells are not norm the cells you're putting it in might not be used to having it. This is true of any imaging, any method you put in. Remember, you're not looking at the normal system. If you do OCT, you're probably doing it. But if you put some other marker in there, you've perturbed the system. It's that's a it's a really good point to remember. We are struggling with um, a new microscope system for detecting very low emission. Uh, yield emission, very low uh, 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 fluorescence emission, but very low yield. Not 1 or 2 percent, it's 10 to minus 6 or 10 to minus 7. So is, do you, are you aware of any special technique that we could use, or do you have any uh, uh, tips for us? Yeah, so, well, this t it, it is fluorescence, is it, that you're looking at? It's actually it's it uh, phosphorescence in the infrared. Ah, okay. But we have a camera, but... Uh, okay, so the best system for that is... Oh, what's the name? Um, so I've done some imaging of luciferase, which, again, is not quite... This, it, that's bioluminescence, it's not phosphorescence, but it, it, the light levels are very low. And there is a system that's made with uh, an electron... Um, an EM CCD camera, so it's an electron multiplier CCD camera. Yeah. That you need to, but we doesn't. We don't have one in the infrared. For no, that ah, oh, sorry, you've now given me an extra thing. You've now yes. said, oh, can you do it in the infrared? Yeah, no, it gets even harder because the background noise, the, the 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 inherent background emission from the camera is always a problem. What we've been doing in the case of fluorescence, one of the techniques we use a great deal, and we do it. You can do it with cameras as well. Is to use what's called lock-in detection. Ah. So you put it you turn your light source on and off and in simplistic terms oh. you just turn the camera on or the camera's on all the time but it compares when it's expecting to see a signal and when it's not expecting to see a signal and you can average that and that removes background or c sorry can help to remove background count and you can do that with a camera as well so it's techniques like that that we use we use that a lot in multi-photon microscopy wonderful so if if uh, if I can talk to you a little bit. Yes, later. no. And so again, I'm going to use this as an, as a, as an advert. Please come up and speak to us while we're here. I'm saying, you know, that's what we're here for. And so don't feel scared that there are these people that have come all over. You know, they're all important and all that sort. No, we're not. Um, we we do all the things that you do. We and so please feel free to come up and ask us the questions. Thank you, Professor, again. Thank you.